Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first session of our RSET webinar series, Remote Sensing of Drought. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your instructor along with Amita Mehta and Cindy Schmidt. This is a two session course that will take place on July 12th and July 19th. There are two sessions each day, depending on which time works best for your location. Session A will be at 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern, and session B will be at 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Please make sure that you're only signed up for and attend one of these session times. We've created two sessions to reach our broader international audience. We will have lectures and demonstrations, followed by exercises online and in QGIS that you can follow along with each session. We will have one homework assignment. This will include a document with the steps that you must take and answers that will need to be submitted via Google Forms. The link will be available after the final session on the website, and we will post it in the chat box during the final week. To receive credit for homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by August 2nd. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend both live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about um, two months after the completion of this course. There are two prerequisites for this course. First, you should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. You can watch our on-demand course listed above, which includes three one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. Second, you must have a QGIS, you must have QGIS downloaded and installed on your computer to complete the exercises. So please ensure it's working properly prior to, to um, doing the exercises and the homework. You can find all the course materials listed on the website here. This includes past recordings, the presentation materials, the um, in-class exercises, and the link to the homework. We also have the exercises and the PDF of today's presentation in the handouts portion of the um, GoToWebinar panel. We will also eventually have all of our um, materials available in Spanish. Please note that in order to view the uh, web webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who is viewing them. And once you register, you'll automatically be taken to uh, view the recording. So here's an overview of the course outline. This week, we'll be providing a general overview of the use of remote sensing for drought monitoring. This week, we will review drought classification discuss how remote sensing can be used for drought monitoring. Then we'll focus specifically on precipitation and vegetation uses of drought monitoring. We'll provide a demonstration of some web-based tools, and then we'll guide you through two in-class exercises. These will focus on downloading precipitation and NDVI data. You can follow along with us, or you can go through these exercises on your own. The documentation of the exercise of the exercises is located on the website and as I mentioned in the handout section um, in the panel here. So now I'll hand it over to Amita who will provide an overview of drought classification. Thank you, Amber, and welcome everyone. Uh, we will start with overview of drought classification. So as you can see, um, there are four major types of droughts, uh, meteorological drought, agricultural drought, hydrological drought, and socioeconomic drought. And as the figure shows on the right-hand side, they all start from climate variability. So all droughts actually originate from below normal precipitation, below normal compared to a long-term average or normal precipitation, um, which occurs uh, over many years, deviation from that uh, decides drought condition. So as we see in the next slide, each drought has different duration and different parameters are affected by the droughts. 
So starting with meteorological drought, it is related to degree of dryness as compared to normal precipitation. And as shown here, it is reduction in precipitation as well as evaporation or evapotranspiration increase. So this really meteorological drought occurs when there is net um, reduction in water availability. So there are two components. It's usually a shorter time, less. It starts from a couple of weeks all the way to about six months. It can be meteorological drought. It also, because of the nature of the precipitation itself, it's highly variable in um, space. And it is region specific because normal precipitation also varies from space to space, uh, place to place very quickly. So meteorological drought uh, has high variability, not only in space, also in time from weeks to uh, six months. Um, down after, because of the meteorological drought and because of the unavailability of enough water, agricultural drought sets up and that is due to um, soil water decrease and that eventually results in vegetation stress and reduction in crop yields. So agricultural drought follows meteorological drought and it can occur uh, about six months later, a few months later or season later after meteorological drought. Finally, hydrological drought, which occurs uh, because again of reduction in precipitation, but after a few months, more than six months down the road, there is reduction in stream flow and runoff. Uh, groundwater also gets depleted and reservoir and lake levels also go down. Wetlands are affected by it as well. So hydrological drought results uh, from long term persistent uh, deficit of rainfall and that usually occurs um, longer than six months after the meteorological drought sets up. Finally, impacts of these droughts are on economic, social, and ecological conditions. So as the next slide shows, a hydrological drought, as we just talked about, it's related to rain and also snow uh, melt and snow shortfall. Um, it impacts surface and subsurface water su supply, and uh, it, it affects uh, agricultural drought also. So ecological drought, on the other hand, is um, prolonged and widespread deficit in naturally available water supplies, and that creates multiple stresses across ecosystems. So wetlands are affected, also uh, stream flow reduces. And so because of a number of reasons, uh, ecological drought um, is widespread. So socioeconomic drought, it is impact of all types of droughts. It is not related just to uh, climate variability related drought conditions, but also depends on population changes related to supply and demand um, the drought is related to supply and demand rates of uh, goods and economy. Uh, it's affected by uh, agricultural, ecological, and hydrological situations and socioeconomic changes also. Uh, as it depends on supply and demand of goods, it depends on other factors such as uh, transportation, uh, how uh, goods are distributed. So a number of factors in addition to other drought conditions, uh, they cause socioeconomic drought. So what we're going to do in this webinar is we're going to look at remote sensing data which help in monitoring droughts. All three types of droughts, meteorological, agricultural, and hydrological droughts can be monitored by using remote sensing data directly or data derived from remote sensing. So we're going to review some of those uh, data sets and see how they help in monitoring droughts. To start with, we have a list of satellites here. Uh, these are NASA satellites which are useful for drought monitoring and we'll start. Landsat uh, is one mission that's the longest mission yeah, and it, it was launched in uh, 1972 and a uh, number of Landsat series of satellites, they have been flying. So the current version is Landsat 8. And the next two satellites, Tropical Rainfall Measure, Measuring Mission or TRIM, that was launched in November 1997, and it ended in April 2015. This 
was one of the first uh, satellites that was dedicated for tropical rainfall measurement. And GPM, which is Global Precipitation Measurement, it's a follow-on mission to TRIM. That was launched recently, more recently in, in February 2014, and it is likely to continue and extend the precipitation observations that were provided by TRIM. The next two satellites, Terra and Aqua, they are also have been flying for a long time. Uh, Terra started in December 1999 and Aqua in May 2002. These two satellites carry a number of sensors, but one sensor, MODIS, that Amber is going to talk about, um, it, it is used for uh, vegetation index derivation. So these two satellites have been quite useful for that. The most recently launched satellite, Soil Moisture Active Passive, or SMAP, that, that was launched in January of 2015. This is again dedicated for measuring uh, surface soil moisture. And finally, last but not the least, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRACE. That satellite uh, has been flying since March of 2002. It provides terrestrial water storage, and it is used to derive groundwater information. There's also a follow-on satellite to Grace is uh, planned. Uh, in, in the bottom, you will see a link to uh, RSET fundamental webinars or on-demand webinars. Uh, there are information about all these satellites and sensors in great detail. So we recommend that you review this uh, webinar. So what well, we want to do is look at the parameters which help in monitoring different types of droughts. And here's a table that shows which satellites are useful for which type of drought monitoring. For meteorological drought, as we mentioned earlier, precipitation is the most important parameter. And TRIM and GPM, they provide um, almost continuous more than 17 to 18 years of precipitation data. Agricultural drought, uh, it's monitored by uh, using normalized difference vegetation index and evapotranspiration. And these two parameters are available from Landsat, Terra and Aqua Modis sensor. Hydrological drought, again, which um, depletes soil moisture and groundwater, can be um, measured from SMAP and GRACE satellites. So we're going to focus on um, these types of droughts. What we will do is we're going to look at um, actually do analysis of precipitation and normalize difference vegetation index for MODIS to analyze meteorological and agricultural drought conditions. What we are also going to do is learn to visualize soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and groundwater anomalies, which help in monitoring droughts, um, agricultural as well as hydrological drought. So we are going to um, look at all these parameters today and then next week. So what we're going to do is review uh, these satellites very quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, the prerequisite uh, webinar has more details about these satellites and sensors. We'll start with TRIM and GPM, which provide precipitation for drought monitoring. So TRIM and GPM both were a joint mission with Japanese space agency, JAXA. Both of them are in non-polar um, uh, non-polar orbiting satellites. As you can see here on the right-hand side, uh, the yellow uh, orbits are for TRIM and blue for GPM. So they don't cover pole to pole. TRIM uh, was focused on tropics. So actual measurements were from 35 south to 35 north. And the data then were obtained uh, between 50 south and 50 north. GPM, on the other hand, has a better coverage from including um, mid latitude and high latitude in addition to tropics. And it provides coverage from 65 south to 65 north. Uh, the multiple sensors are flying on, uh, were able, were, sorry, present on TRIM. Uh, TRIM, microwave imager, precipitation radar, and visible and infrared scanner. These three were flying on TRIM to uh, measure precipitation. GPM has sensors such as uh, 
GPM microwave imager and dual frequency precipitation radar. So these sensors uh, are used to derive precipitation rates from um, these satellites. So, uh, however, as uh, Trim and GPM, both satellites, they provide 16 orbits um, per day, and there are orbital gaps in between. So also, um, Im microwave imagers and uh, radar, they have different swath widths. Because of that, there are sampling issues, and um, these satellites don't have a very good temporal or spatial coverage all the time of precipitation systems. That's why uh, these satellites are used with a suite of other or constellation of other satellites as shown here. There is GPM core observatory that's been flying. In addition, there are national, national and international satellites which also fly uh, microwave um, radiometers or imagers uh, from the US, Japan, uh, France, India, and European Space Agency. These um, measurements are combined with TRIM and GPM core observations. So TRIM and GPM satellites are used as calibrator for all other satellites, and a multi-satellite um, algorithm or data are derived. So these are quite useful for applications. TRIM multi-satellite precipitation analysis, or TMPA, uh, that uh, has been used widely for many applications, including for drought monitoring, as we will see in an example later. There is integrated multi-satellite retrievals for GPM. So this is multi-satellite product from GPM. And both these products, um, they have better spatial and temporal coverage, and so they are more useful for uh, applications such as drought monitoring. just to provide an overview of these two uh, products so for tmpa special resolution has been quarter degree by quarter degree whereas imerge has a higher resolution of one tenth of a degree uh, special coverage um, here is global both in longitude tmpa from 50 south to 50 north and gpm from 60 south to 60 north but soon it will be extended from pole to pole TMPA has temporal resolution of three hours, and iMERGE has 30 minutes. Uh, TMPA has been available for more than uh, 17 years, as mentioned here. Important thing to note here is that after 2015, when TRIM satellite actually ended, still a product known as TMPA is available because all the Constellation satellites, they provide um, measurements and they are calibrated with trim climatological uh, calibration and so even though trim is no longer flying tmpa like product continues from uh, other satellites which are calibrated with climatological trim data and uh, in early 2018 there will be a combined tmpa and imerge record will be made available at the iMERGE data resolution. So this will provide a long-term uh, precipitation record based on remote sensing. So TRIM and GPM data, where to get them? Uh, precipitation measurement mission site shown here is the home of all the information about TRIM and GPM. And so data access link here uh, guides you to get data all level one to level three data. Um, and there are multiple web tools uh, which can be used to get the data. In addition, in GPM application um, link, there is also a training link which provides step-by-step -step instruction about how to uh, obtain GPM data and documentation and all the web tools, how to use them to get the data. So this is the uh, portal, data access download portal. And what we are going to do for this webinar is we're going to use TMPA or TRIM multi-satellite precipitation analysis, which also is known as 3B42 uh, as name of the algorithm. And so we're going to use that TMPA 3B42. 
uh, we are going to look at monthly precipitation, which also is referred to as 3B43 occasionally. So we're going to look at TMPA monthly precipitation. And as you can see here, there are multiple web tools. There are multiple formats of these data available as well. What we are going to do is we're going to use Giovanni. This is one portal uh, that we're going to use today's exercise to download data because it allows for spatial and temporal subsetting and analysis and visualization of data. Next satellite we want to review is Soil, Soil Moisture Active Passive or SMAP, which was launched in January 2015. SMAP is in polar orbit, unlike Trim and GPM. Um, which were low inclination orbit. SMAP covers from pole to pole, has swath width, which is quite wide, of about 1,000 kilometers, and um, it provides global coverage in two to three days. So soil moisture over entire globe can be obtained in about two to three days. Uh, SMAP um, had two sensors, microwave radiometer and microwave radar. Unfortunately, uh, radar is not currently working, so those data are not available, but soil moisture based on radiometer is available. So as shown here, um, radiometer based soil moisture, it has a resolution of 36 kilometers. And as we mentioned, it has three day global coverage. In addition, there is um, level four data, which is root zone soil moisture. In this data set, SMAP observations or soil moisture observations are uh, assimilated in a land surface model. And based on the model and data, you get um, root zone soil moisture. Um, so measuring uh, moisture in the top five uh, centimeters. And uh, these model data have higher resolution of nine kilometer. Also, it's available at higher temporal resolution, like three hourly and even weekly. So SMAP soil moisture data, although the record itself is short, it started in 2015, it helps, this is high quality soil moisture observations. So it allows uh, to monitor soil moisture variability from week to week or from month to month or from season to season or annually. So that is useful in monitoring hydrologic drought and also uh, how it can impact agricultural drought. How to get uh, SMAP data? So SMAP data can be accessed from NSIDC or National Snow and Ice Data Center. Once you go to this website, you will see a link to soil moisture. And once you select the link, you will have all the SMAP data from um, radiometer, and radar when it was available earlier, all the level two to level four data, including root zones, soil moisture, they can be obtained from this site. So, also, um, gray satellite uh, also is there, which provides uh, groundwater information. This brings us to Landsat. And Amber is going to talk about Landsat um, satellite and sensors. All right, thank you, Amita. Landsat is probably one of the most popular satellites, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it before. The first Landsat was launched in the early 1970s. Most recently, Landsat 8 was launched in February of 2013. So we have this continuous data at fairly high resolution, which is really useful for examining land surface changes over time. All of these data are freely available from the USGS. Landsat is a passive sensor that provides optical imagery of the globe every 16 days. The figure on the bottom shows the difference in the band coverage between Landsats 4 through 7 and Landsat 8. It also provides information about the atmospheric window that allows sensors to obtain data within these spectral ranges. These windows represent wavelengths at which the electromagnetic radiation will penetrate the Earth's atmosphere and can thus be observed by our sensors. So those are indicated here in gray. Notice that, that the bandwidths are similar for the um, different Landsat sensors particularly in the visible range, 
but they're not identical. So it's really important to understand these differences when applying the same processes to images from these um, two different sensors. This table summarizes the differences in band numbers between Landsat 8 and Landsats 4, 5, and 7. The red and near-infrared bands are the ones that are important for our Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI calculation, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in more detail later. As you notice here, the bands are different for Landsat 8 and for the other um, Landsat sensors. So it's really important to know this. If you would be calculating NDVI on your own using Landsat, you want to make sure you have the, the correct band number. MODIS is another one of those key imaging instruments of um, NASA Earth observations, and um, Amina mentioned this earlier. It's designed to measure large-scale global dynamics across the land, oceans, and atmosphere. So it fly, the sensor um, flies on two different satellites to capture imagery of the same area on Earth at different times of day. The two instruments are almost identical. Terra Modis passes from north to south across the equator in the morning, and Aqua Modis passes from south to north across the equator in the afternoon. So this allows Modis to observe any location um, in the mid to high latitudes twice daily, so a daytime pass and a nighttime pass. Here are some of the Modis land products available. It's much easier to call MODIS products by their shortened name, as shown here in this table. For example, the vegetation indices products that we are going to use for this webinar series are called MOD13. This table also provides um, some of the other products that are useful for things like land management, such as land cover change, leaf area index, primary production, etc. You can also see the um, that the spatial and the temporal resolution for each of these products varies um, from 8-day to 16-day monthly and yearly. Global MODIS vegetation indices are designed to provide consistent spatial and temporal comparisons of vegetation conditions. These include products where um, the NDVI is calculated, and also where the EVI, or the Enhanced Vegetation Index, is calculated. Global data are provided every 16 days, either at 250 meter or 500 meter spatial resolution. And you can obtain these as gridded products in the sinusoidal projection. And you can actually, as we'll see later, change the projection um, of the data that you obtain from the website. These products are really useful in identifying vegetation health and can also indicate when vegetation is stressed, which may be influenced by those drought conditions. The NDVI is more chlorophyll sensitive, while the EVI is more responsive to canopy structure variations, including things like the leaf area index or the canopy type. One thing to think about with using the NDVI is that it saturates over high biomass areas. So the EVI was developed to optimize that vegetation signal with improved sensitivity in high biomass regions. So here you can see that for the Landsat um, data, you generally have to do the NDVI calculation yourself, whereas with the MODIS products, the calculations are done for you and you can download them as a product. So now I will hand it back over to Amita, who will discuss um, the drought monitoring with precipitation specifically. So thanks, Amber. So uh, we will start uh, by looking at how to monitor drought by using precipitation. As we mentioned, meteorological drought or any type of drought, it starts from deficit of precipitation. So um, precipitation anomalies are used generally as drought indicator. So anomalies are actually departure from long-term climatological mean values, and they indicate either dry or wet conditions compared to the climatological conditions. 
So for example, for any given month, if you have precipitation data and you have climatology for that month, the difference between the two will tell you whether this particular month is wetter or drier compared to normal rainfall. And that provides indication of drought. So example shown here on the right hand side is um, accumulated precipitation from uh, trim data. It's a, um, and what it's shown here is data accumulated over California, which 2012 to 2014. And what is shown here is the anomalies as percentage of climatological mean. And as you can see, the negative values here, they show deficit or drought-like conditions. And on uh, entire uh, state of California, you can see negative anomalies ranging from 70 to almost 100%. So looking at precipitation anomaly maps can quickly give you a picture of where there is uh, excess or, or deficit of rainfall compared to climatology. Similarly, one can look at uh, climatology and anomaly time series uh, over any region, um, and that provides um, how drought evolved over time. So in this case, again, it is trim data. Uh, trim precipitation is averaged uh, from 1998 to 2016. And for each month, um, accumulated rainfall is shown, which is average of these years. And as you can see, the uh, rainy season is uh, starts from about October to about March, there it's rainy season. And then uh, this is the non-rainy season over California. So this is the climatology. And now if you look at 2015, this is departure from climatology for that particular uh, year. And the months are shown here. You can see that for almost entire year, there were negative anomalies. Each month had a rainfall deficit compared to climatological rainfall. So looking at uh, area averaged uh, or at, at any particular location, looking at the time series of anomalies also can provide indication of how um, intensity of uh, drought changes as anomalies uh, change, change in amplitudes. So this is how precipitation anomalies are used to quickly look at the drought conditions. However, conventional use of um, drought monitoring uh, is precipitation-based drought indices. And so they are derived from climatological as well as current precipitation data. And it's a mathematical expression that really um, it, it analyzes frequency, severity, and duration of drought at any location. And it also, this indices, um, they, and precipitation anomalies from one place to another, they can have very different magnitudes and sometimes are hard to interpret uh, from one region going to another as they're highly variable in space. Drought indices um, can help um, more standardized analysis. Uh, between space and time, uh, over space and time. So they are used and the commonly used uh, precipitation based drought indices are standardized precipitation index and Palmer drought severity index. And there is a handbook of drought indicators and indices, which is available from World Meteorological okay. Organization and also from uh, Global Water Partnership. So there is more information about these indices uh, can be found in this handbook. So we will have a brief review of SPI and PDSI. So standardized precipitation index, um, it's again a mathematical expression of how rainfall varies and it's, it, it's based on representing cumulative probability function of uh, precipitation and it really um, it can be interpreted as number of standard deviations by which the observed rainfall anomalies, they deviate from long-term mean or climatology. So SPI is primarily, primarily used to characterize meteorological drought. There's an example shown here, which is a 30-day mean SPI from May 15th to June 13th of this year. And as you can see, the values here go from minus three to three. And 
negative values, they show deficit of rainfall. So you can see that there is um, a meteorological drought-like conditions in Dakotas and part of Montana, also part of Texas. So wherever you have a negative SPI, it represents drought-like condition or meteorological drought uh, conditions. Um, so next. So SPI has one advantage is that it can be averaged over different period. So you can do it over a month, over three months, uh, six months, 12 months, and even um, two years as shown here. And what it shows is a drought category based on SPI average. Uh, colors are shown here. So not it, what it provides information about short to medium term um, drought conditions. So three month uh, SPI it reflects short to medium term moisture conditions uh, or precipitation condition. Six month SPI is more medium term uh, precipitation conditions and that includes more seasonal precipitation pattern. Nine month average SPI is medium term drought that potentially affects agriculture and 12 month and longer SPI they represent drought that are potentially affect hydrology conditions such as stream flow and reservoir levels. So by averaging this what like here in example this is from Climate Prediction Center NOAA uh, you can see that from two years to coming to recent months, you can see how drought conditions have developed over Dakotas, part of Dakotas and Montana, as you can see here, uh, based on negative SPI. So it tells uh, how recently or how persistent droughts are going on. So there are strengths and limitations in using SPI. First of all, it's easy to calculate and it depends uh, mainly on precipitation. Um, you can look at different time scales that indicate uh, drought impacts on agriculture and hydrology. Um, and uh, it is conventionally used uh, by many um, centers and US uh, drought mitigation center. Uh, they have a program to calculate SPI, which can be found at this link. It requires a little bit of learning how to calculate SPI, but it is available. Um, on the other hand, there are some limitations of using SPI to, to look at drought conditions. First of all, it just is based on available uh, water supply or precipitation alone. It does not take into account how temperature is varying or evapotranspiration is changing. So it just the availability of precipitation not overall water budget is not looked at. So water that is lost or depleted is not accounted for. Also, SPI is sensitive to which climatological precipitation is used. So how long the record is uh, of climatology. And so if there is no uniform climatology from place to place, then SPI is not something you can compare from place to place for drought severity. Uh, also, uh, precipitation intensity, um, how it affects other water budget components such as runoff, stream flow, and water availability over given region is not considered. It is just the precipitation. So next index, which is Palmer Drought Severity Index, is uh, somewhat better uh, in that sense that it takes care of uh, precipitation and uh, temperature or evapotranspiration. It takes care of a total water balance. So Palmer in 1965 uh, published um, and provided formula to calculate uh, this drought index. And that uh, you can see from here that PDSI for a given month M depends on um, PDSI from previous months, as well as there is a function that depends on moisture anomaly available based on a water balance model. So, and that depends on temp air temperature. So it not PDSI takes care of availability of precipitation as well as depletion of water 
due to uh, evapotranspiration. And so that is a um, standardized index that goes from minus 10, which is dry, to 10, which is wet. So one, um, this is usually a long-term drought that is uh, monitored by PDSI. Um, and it is usually monthly uh, and long-term drought, they are monitored by PDSI. So there is more information available from um, Climate Prediction Center, NOAA, not only about PDSI, also has information about SPI, as we saw earlier. So again, so PDSI also has strengths and limitations, as we talked about. It's more effective for long-term drought. So short-term droughts sometimes uh, are more effectively noted by SPI, whereas long-term drought are by PDSI. Um, they take into account um, surface air temperature, evapotranspiration, so overall water balance is considered, um, and takes a prior month's condition into account. So if there is a persistent drought going on, so it's that also is considered. However, it lacks multi-time scale features like SPI. And again, PDSI also is not easily comparable uh, from uh, one place to place. Uh, there is a self-calibrating PDSI now available. Uh, so also, it assumes precipitation is uh, instantaneously or immediately available. So runoff into or out of the region is not considered, as well as snow and ice melt as water source is not considered in these indices. So these are the indices still are very conventionally used um, by for monitoring drought conditions. As shown here, SPI and PDSI are available from uh, NOAA. And over um, they are also based on surface data um, over the US and, and North America. So that's available from a drought monitor that we will review later as well. Um, con operational SPI and PDSI based on satellite data are not available. However, there are experimental and research and application products. And one example uh, is a paper uh, given here in the reference that uses trim TMPA to calculate uh, SPI and also uh, PDSI. So satellite data have been used to calculate SPI and PDSI um, for, um, for, for research and applications by particular researchers. But operationally, these data are available mainly from surface-based data. So this brings us to our, our next part, and which is drought monitoring by using vegetation. And I will hand it over to Amber. All right, thank you, Amita. So now we're going to discuss um, the vegetation indices used for drought monitoring, particularly NDVI. When sunlight strikes plant leaves, the chlorophyll in those leaves strongly absorbs the visible light the blue and the red wavelengths. And the cell structure of the leaves reflects the green and also strongly reflects near infrared light. This is portrayed here in the graphic on the top as well as in the spectral signature curves on the bottom. The two key wavelengths for NDVI are red and near infrared. In the graph, you can see where the red is being absorbed, where it has a low reflectance, and the near-infrared is highly reflective. So NDVI is really that relationship between the red and the near-infrared wavelengths. The formula is specified here. The values of NDVI for an individual pixel range from negative 1 to 1. Any pixel between negative 1 and 0 means no vegetation, and pixels close to one indicate the highest possible density of green leaves. The picture here on the right shows that healthy green vegetation absorbs most of the visible light, and here only 8% is reflected. And it reflects a large portion of the near-infrared light, where 50% is reflected. Unhealthy, sparse, or senescing vegetation reflects more visible light. Here, 30% is reflected um, in the 
on the right of the figure. And it reflects less near infrared light. Here, 40% is reflected. So you can see the differences in the resulting NDVI values below the image. The green vegetation has a value closer to 1. Here it's 0.72 while the brown vegetation has a value closer to zero. Here it's 0.14. NDVI anomalies are used to show current vegetation patterns relative to the long-term averages. This can be calculated by subtracting the long-term mean from the current value, and it's often done on a monthly basis. For example, if the anomaly is negative, this indicates that the vegetation is less green than normal which may be indicative of drought. The brown and red areas in these pictures from the southwestern U.S. show um, many negative anomalies for the years specified. These images also help to illustrate the NDVI anomaly calculation. In the vegetation exercises for the webinar, we'll be generating the long-term NDVI average from 2001 to 2010 for the second week in July. To do this, we'll obtain one NDVI image from the same time period each year. Then we'll use those 10 images to calculate an average. Independently, we'll obtain the NDVI image from the second week of July 2015. Finally, we'll subtract that long-term average NDVI from the July 2015 image. And this will allow us to generate those NDVI anomalies for July 2015. Again, in regions where there are negative anomalies, in this figure here on the right, they're shown in red. So the vegetation is less healthy or drier than it is on average. Here's an example of an NDVI anomaly map that highlights the recent California drought. The image here shows anomalies from January 17th to February 1st of 2014 again against the average conditions over the same time period from the past decade. The brown colors indicate below average anomalies and the green colors indicate above average. You can notice that much of the um, San Joaquin or Central Valley um, in the center portion of the state has below average vegetation values. Um, and this is a region where there is a lot of agriculture. Well, you can also then see some green values or positive anomalies in the Sierra Nevada, which is located just to the east of the valley. That's actually a function of um, very low snowpack levels compared to the average. So usually during this time period in the winter, um, the vegetation is covered with snow. Um, thus, because there's less snow, the values are higher than normal. And so this also can indicate the decrease in snowpack, which is uh, bad for California water as much of uh, the water supply comes from that snowpack reservoir. So NDVI is one of the most widely used indices in the world to identify the state of vegetation health. It can also be used to understand phenology of plants throughout a particular year and also to track uh, green up events. It's also been used recently to improve agricultural production and to help manage water resources. This can also relate to um, soil moisture in a region. So this figure on the right shows an example of how NDVI can indicate drought and crop conditions, which are really important for agricultural regions. Again, the brown colors are below average NDVI values, where the green indicates above average. So this is an example um, of crop conditions in South Africa from 2015, or excuse me, 2013. Another index that you can use to calculate on your own using Landsat is the Normalized Difference Moisture Index, or NDMI. This highlights the vegetation moisture, and again, as I mentioned, um, this is generally used with Landsat. So the NDMI is not a, a product that's available via MODIS, but you can do the calculation on your own using the bands of Landsat. It uses the near-infrared and the shortwave infrared band. 
The shortwave infrared band highlights the difference between clouds, ice, and snow. Shortwave near-infrared light is reflected strongly from plants and is also a good indicator of vegetation moisture. So if more subtle changes in vegetation can be detected, it's another useful index for drought and also things like fire potential. If the index is low, where vegetation is present, this could mean that the vegetation is dry. Remember that in order to obtain an NDMI image via Landsat, you'll need to manually do the calculation yourself, um, as it's not a standard product that's available. You also need to consider the differences in the band numbers between Landsats 4 through 7 and Landsat 8. The figure on the right here shows you an example of what the NDMI looks like, again with brown areas indicating drier vegetation. So next, what we're going to do is talk about um, a couple of web-based drought monitoring tools. Uh, so we're going to introduce what these tools do and demonstrate some of the features. Uh, these tools are based on uh, surface observations, satellite observations, as well as models. So they combine different observations and models and come up with different types of drought monitoring capabilities. The idea here is to present these tools which can aid in real-time drought monitoring um, in different locations. So we're going to basically go through introduction of the features and then you can explore the sites on your own. So the first tool that we're going to talk about is National Integrated Drought Information System or NIDIS. NIDIS is really the US uh, uh, drought portal and uh, we're going to demo that. That has both US and global drought monitoring capability. It provides current as well as past information about droughts. Um, and it provides surface-based precipitation temperature, uh, standardized precipitation index as just we talked about, and also Palmer drought severity index. These are available through the site. Um, there is satellite-based vegetation health index also available. And uh, there are interactive maps that quickly provide visual information of where uh, droughts are occurring and what is the severity of these droughts. So we're going to go through demo of this site first. This is the website where you will find NIDIS information. Uh, this is the website. And what we're going to look at is a few major features that focus on current drought or which aids in monitoring drought. But you can see that on top, you will see US um, drought monitoring capability, and these maps are shown here. There is also North American um, drought monitoring capability and global as well. So we're going to start with the US drought monitor. Um, and then subsequently, what we're going to do is quickly look at um, North American and global drought monitoring capabilities. We will also look at some of the data, maps, and tools which are interactively available. And a lot of resources are available which you can explore later on uh, according to your interest and where you're located. So to start with, you can see that where is drought this week? So every time you go to this site, you get weekly reports on uh, droughts. So this is as of June 28th, and so this is the week that is focused on, and there are drought severities that we will see in a minute. It also gives a uh, quick information about uh, how much uh, of the US, 8.5% of the lower 48 states uh, are affected by drought. Also, it is talking about how many people are affected by drought conditions. So you can see details by US Trout Monitor. You can click on the US Trout Monitor. This uses, again, uh, data from NOAA, uh, USDS, uh, University of uh, Nebraska. It also uh, provides uh, information. And NASA GRACE data are experimentally used in deciding where the drought is occurring. So once you go to this map, you will see the latest week where drought is occurring. Um, and what you see here is uh, different intensities of drought are indicated. 
uh, yellow, which is D0 all the way to uh, red is D3, and dark red is D4. It goes from anomalously dry to abnormally dry to moderate drought to severe drought, extreme drought, and exceptional drought. So what you can see is during the last week, uh, there is abnormally dry conditions where you see yellow colors, where there is red and um, orange colors. That's where actually extreme drought is occurring uh, during this week. What you see here is that in, in California, also there is long, you see S and L. S represents short-term drought, which is uh, less than six months. Uh, in, in, in duration, and that represents mostly agricultural uh, kind of uh, drought, which starts from uh, meteorological drought. So deficit of rainfall causes and impacts crops, and that is reflected in short-term droughts. Long-term droughts, on the other hand, are typically, they last longer than six months, and uh, they represent more hydrology and ecology kind of uh, drought situations. So what you see is that there are long-term droughts going on here in, in the southwestern US and uh, California, uh, and short-term droughts you can see uh, in other places. Uh, US Drought Monitor uses data from NOVA, from USDA, from uh, National Drought Mitigation Center in uh, University of Nebraska, um, and also uh, NASA GRACE data, groundwater data, are experimentally used now to monitor uh, short-term to long-term drought uh, over the US. So this provides a quick information or a quick look at where current drought is going on and how long it has been going on. So if how it helps is that in your area, if you're interested in understanding or studying or monitoring drought, you can quickly come in, look at the map, see whether any of the, the region where you are there may be uh, abnormally dry condition or there is a drought going on, then you can pick that area and then uh, do analysis of precipitation and NDVI as we are going to do in this webinar. In addition, there is also US seasonal drought outlook. What you see here is a model-based uh, drought tendency during next three months so this start, this was posted on June 15, and it goes till September uh, 30th. So next three months, this shows where drought uh, would be persisting. If it is brown, it, it remains, but it improves. Uh, drought uh, removal is likely, and drought development is likely. So these are the categories. And what you can see is that there is uh, drought will be persisting in parts of California here. Uh, you can see that drought uh, remains, but uh, there is some improvement going on in, in Dakotas and, and part of Montana. Uh, and um, you have drought removal likely in, in uh, places as shown here um, in many locations. So this is, again, a quick outlook of where there will be uh, drying conditions either developing or be persisting or there may be reversal of uh, drought. So this is also a useful information to have uh, for future. Uh, another thing NIDIS provides is drought impact reports. This is, again, based on media reports and a local um, information is provided. We're not going to go into detail, but this is just for information that informa by state by state, you can get information about um, there is impact on agriculture, uh, energy, plants and wildlife, society and public health, water supply and quality, business and industry, fire. If there are any relief operations going on, there are response and restrictions. They are reported. Uh, and so by clicking on how many reports are there um, that is depicted, uh, you can find information by counties, by states, by multiple states. So this is something, it is uh, impacts that are reported uh, in, in di these different sectors. So they provide um, more information about um, if, um, where and what kind of impacts are occurring. So we go back to the NIDIS page now. Here's the page. 
So you can also explore additional information about wildfire risks and NIDIS in your region. Um, one last thing I want to show about this tool is data maps and tools. And what you can see here is once you go to data maps and tools, uh, you will see current conditions and outlooks and forecasts that we just saw and impacts that we just saw. But in addition, you have soil moisture information, groundwater, surface water monitoring, crop, mo crop moisture maps, there is vegetation information, there is fire information, uh, temperature and precipitation, also anomalies and forecasts, and uh, weather and crop bulletins uh, are available uh, from, from this. There is also information about um, different database that you can search and uh, official software uh, that uh, really is used by NIDES for um, deciding different types of droughts and um, deciding the intensity and uh, um, how data are used, etc. So if you look at the data, again, it puts you back to US Drought Monitor. You have evaporative stress index map. Um, which also is um, based on satellite data. MODIS and GOES both are used for deriving evapotranspiration or evaporative uh, stress index that indicates um, drought condition. Um, and then you have drought risk atlas that provides historical data um, about drought through 2012, and these are based on weather station data across the U.S. So this is basically um, a lot of information. And the reason for a quick introduction to this site is that uh, for, for US, a lot of information is av available if you are trying to monitor drought and really trying to get more information related to drought condition. If you go back to uh, NIDIS web, web page again, um, we looked at the US part. We saw how data and maps uh, and tools can be obtained. Uh, similarly, similar techniques are used to get North American uh, drought monitoring as well. It's the same categories as we just saw for um, US drought monitor. Now Mexico and Canada are also included in this monitor. Um, and quickly, we want to go look at the global drought monitor as well. Here. When you click on the current conditions, you will see drought conditions. Again, it is the similar categories that yellow is where abnormally dry conditions are there all the way to red and dark red where there are severe droughts occurring. So these uh, drought indices are based on uh, global climatology, um, global precipitation climatology center uh, data, which are based on rain gauge data over the world. And based on that, um, it, it can be seen where there is what kind of drought conditions is occurring. So again, the reason to look at this site is that um, without even going into great detail of um, data and anomaly calculations for precipitation or soil moisture or vegetation, you can quickly zoom in and see whether the region you are interested in is uh, affected by any kind of drought condition. And based on that, you can design your analysis or your decision-making approach. So these are some uh, quick-looking tools. So, so nine days, we saw, again, to summarize, it has US drought monitor, it has North American Drought Monitor and this Global Drought Monitor. And when you explore, you will see that a number of data sets are available related to uh, drought conditions uh, from different sources that you can explore. There are also software tools available that uh, also you can um, look at. So then we're going to move to next um, web tool. So we looked at NIDIS. The next one we're going to talk about is a, uh, we saw US Drought Monitor, Global Drought Monitor, and Drought Outlook. Um, we are going to look at Famine Early Warning System Network. This uh, website or this portal was created uh, by, it's a joint project 
between NASA, NOAA, USDA, and USGS, and it is also supported by USAID. Um, it uses MODIS and NDVI and trim uh, precipitation, precipitation data also in uh, preparing some of the information that we will see on the website. It provides um, evidence-based famine analysis, um, and that helps government in decision-making uh, and relief agencies where there is humanitarian aid needed. It is based, um, it is designed specifically for Africa, and it shows, uh, this is the fuseness site. What it shows is that um, it, what, where the food insecurities are, are existing. So what you see is from minimal all the way to famine conditions. So when you focus on East Africa, you can see that there are uh, crisis and emergency situation occurring in um, East African countries, uh, especially Kenya and Burundi, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Ken you know, all these. Um, also, um, in the Southern Africa, uh, there are a number of countries where there is a crisis situation about food insecurity or food security. So uh, this, again, is based on uh, surface-based data, evidence-based data, as well as remote sensing data are used in here. Um, this is a, a quick look at where there is famine type of situation may be occurring. And so that helps uh, relief agencies to bring food or aid where it is needed most. Uh, you can have quick links to food assistance needs, food prices, weather hazards, uh, situation in different countries, and climate change um, uh, scenario of, of for, for the location as well. Um, there is, um, again, information more for managing uh, relief activity or distributing food where it is needed. Um, there is a new um, data center that one can visit, and that's where you will see that food security classification data uses a um, special kind of algorithm, and that uses trim and modis data in uh, support of deciding uh, where the uh, famine type of situation may be occurring. Um, you can explore different data sets through uh, these portals, especially remote sensing imagery. You can uh, see that uh, it, it uses this MODIS-based data available. Um, and um, through this, you can get um, they have changed recently from NDVI, uh, Terra to uh, Aqua. So this information you can obtain. That is, there are uh, software tools as well as um, there are um, more like early warning exploration tools that you can see uh, by clicking on these maps. And uh, that provides information about um, early warning about famines. So, So you can explore this at your um, your leisure um, time and understand how uh, famine early morning uh, early warning system works. So uh, NIDIS, which is really more focused on U.S. and global, um, FuseNet focuses mostly on Africa, but it provides it provides an idea of how a decision making tool can work where uh, different types of drought data can be used. So the last, last tool we are going to look at is um, NLDAS uh, drought monitoring uh, system. And that is based on North American land data assimilation. And RSET um, has a webinar that describes uh, land data assimilation models, especially NLDAS. So um, you can get more details from this link here. But what this experimental uh, drought monitor tool does is looks at modeled soil moisture anomalies. Um, so NLDAS has a number of versions. Uh, one is uh, from NOAA, one from NASA. There is also one from the University of um, Princeton. Uh, so different um, um, 
NLDAS versions exist, and they all provide information about uh, soil moisture anomalies. So as you can see from the website, here also there's a quick look at where, uh, so there are a number of um, options available. You have total column soil moisture anomalies. You have current top one meter soil moisture anomalies. That is uh, past week, past month. So these information are available from different versions of NLDAS. So what you can see from the anomalies here, and this particular version is NASA NLDAS version, which is Mosaic. And what you see from all of them is anomalies of, this is um, total column soil moisture. And you can see there is, there is deficit in this particular area, so especially in the Dakotas, where we saw from drought monitor, there's a long-term drought going on. You can quickly see that soil moisture is also depleting in, in this region. This happens to be for July 8th, but you can have uh, this for uh, monthly data. You can have uh, weekly data as well. Um, so different versions are shown and that provide indication of where there is soil moisture depleting and that provides indication of uh, sustained or long-term drought. So again, this is a model-based experimental drought system, but these models, NLDAS versions of models, they assimilate satellite data into them. Um, and so they are a combination of uh, remote sensing, modeling, as well as surface data. So this provides, again, a quick look at soil moisture analysis. So these three tools uh, were presented here uh, just to provide you introduction to such web-based tools, which can provide quick information about where what kind of drought might be occurring. And then that aids you to focus more on zoom into the region you, you want to focus on and then pick the digital data like uh, we're going to do next in exercise, like trim data or Moody's-based NDVI data or even model-based soil moisture data to look at more in-depth uh, conditions. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop um, this demonstration and um, go back to um, my screen and share um, a, a, a yet another tool with you which helps you um, go through exercise 1A in which we're going to look at how to download uh, precipitation data to do drought analysis. So, okay. So this, in this section, what we're going to do is um, download precipitation and NDVI data. And these data we will be using next week to do drought analysis. So the first is exercise 1A, which is precipitation data access for monitoring drought for California. So as we talked about earlier, our case study is going to be California. Uh, so this exercise uh, will download a TMPA, or trim a monthly precipitation analysis data, uh, using a Giovanni portal. Uh, what we are going to do is using Giovanni, we are going to calculate monthly precipitation climatology from TMPA, which is average of precipitation from 2001 to 2010. And we are going to save those files. Next, we are going to look at 2015 monthly data. This was the drought year. And so we will save that as well. And then in next week's exercise, we will use this data and NTPI data along with in QGIS to do drought analysis. So I want to demonstrate Giovanni, how to use it, and how to subset TMPA data for this analysis. So this is the Giovanni web tool or portal. Uh, some of you may already have used it earlier, but if not, this is um, a um, data portal in which you can not only search data by keyword, you can subset uh, temporally as well as specially, and there are multiple analysis and visualization options available on top. You can have maps of data, you can have comparison of different data sets, you can have vertical profiles, 
Uh, you can have time series of data, and there are miscellaneous like histogram or scatter plot. They are also available. What we are going to do here is we're going to look for TMPA, uh, which is the data set we're going to use. And you can see that there are multiple options, three hourly, daily, and monthly. For drought monitoring, we are going to use monthly precipitation data or precipitation rate. If you go here to units, you will see multiple options. We want to make sure that we choose millimeter per month so that uh, when we download the data, we get monthly accumulated rainfall for a particular month. After selecting the data, now we're going to select what kind of analysis we're going to do. So for this, we want to find climatological precipitation. So we are going to choose user defined climatology in here. And once you choose that, you will have option to choose either seasonal or monthly um, climatology. We are going to use months. We are going to select each and every month of data. And we are going to use 2001 to 2010. So we are going to use this 10 year to average uh, precipitation. In special selection, you can have, you can draw a box on a map and choose uh, which area you want to pick. But what we're going to do is we are actually entering exact latitude and uh, longitude for California so that it is easy uh, to look at uh, the region. Here you have uh, west longitude and east longitude, south latitude and north latitude. Once you enter the latitude and longitude, you can click on this draw box icon and it shows you where the area you enter the uh, coordinates for is located. In this case, you can see California. You can zoom in by using uh, this uh, plus arrow or you can have this to change the box shape. After you select everything, um, now you can say plot data. When you do that, it takes uh, time for um, the portal to download and analyze data. Now, you can be following along with these steps, or you have this exercise online which you can do between now and next week to download the data. So to save this time, I have already um, created this climatology project. And once, you have, once your analysis is done, you will get 12 maps. So a January map, which is average between 2001 to 2010. And there is color bar here. You will see maps for January, February, March, all the way to December. And you can see rate in millimeter per month here. So this is only for a quick look. But once you have the data, once you have the maps, once the analysis is done, you can go to this downloads link. When you go to the download link, you will see that there are multiple options again. So the files that your climatological flight files that you just got from Giovanni, they are available in NetCDF format. They are available as PNG images. They are also available as GeoTIFF images and KMZ, which you view with Google Earth. For our analysis, we are going to save all the NetCDF files. On, so you will save them on your computer. By clicking on each file one at a time, you will be able to save these files to your, your computer. Now, what we recommend, though, is that you can see the file names are quite long. It is time average, trim. This is the algorithm uh, number 3B43. This is precipitation. It is from 2001 to 10. And for month January, February, March, all the way to December, and these are the coordinates that you selected. So while these files are quite descriptive, 
when you will do analysis next week, it, it probably um, is very long. So we recommend that you shorten the file names. So these are the NetCDF files. Once you click them, um, you will be able to save them on your computer. And what you do is create a folder. This is a suggestion in TMPA Climatology and save all 12 months with shortened file name such as TMPA Climatology or Climb underscore Jan. This is for January Climatology. You can choose the name you like, but the idea is to shorten the file name so they're easy to deal with. So we're going to, you uh, between now and next week, you will go through all these steps and download this climatological precipitation for California. Once you do that, you now what you're going to do is get uh, trim TMPA data for 2015, which was the drought year. So what you will do is go back to data selection here. You have everything as it was. Now you, you have Instead of 2011, 2001 to 2010, you have 2015. This is a quick way to get uh, one year or multi-year data and for different months. Once you have selected this particular year, everything remains the same and you can again do plot data and that will give you um, plots, which I have done to save time here for 2015. Similar maps like you have you have for climatology, you have now January of 2015, then there is February of 2015, and it the plots clearly show how precipitation changes over the year. But again, to download the data, you will use the downloads link. And here now you have NetCDF files for 2015, just single year. So this is January of 2015 all the way to December of 2015. And as in the case of climatological precipitation, clicking on each file, you will be able to save these NetCDF files on your computer. Again, please shorten the file name so it's easy to work with them um, when you are in QGIS. So these NetCDF files, they can be imported into QGIS. And so that is what we are going to do next week. We are going to uh, analyze these data in, um, in QGIS. So the next step is Amber is going to talk about how to get NDVI data for the same years. OK, thank you, Amita. Again, just um, bear with us for a moment while we switch over um, to my screen and we can um, go through the steps to the exercise. So again, just as a reminder, um, for this portion of the webinar, we're going to step through this exercise 1B, downloading MODIS NDVI. And you can obtain that from the handouts portion here, or you can find it on the website. So I'm just going to go through these steps. So as we discussed, NDVI can be used to characterize the health of vegetation for a particular month. So we're going to examine the same time period um, in California in 2015. So the first step of this exercise is to go to NASA Earth Data. And once we go there, we are going to go to Data Discovery and then Earth Data Search right here. When you first come to this website, if you have not been previously logged into your Earth Data account, you'll be asked to take a tour. And if, you, if this is the first time you've ever used Earth Data, we really recommend that you go ahead and take this tour, although we'll not go through it today. Again, if you're not logged in, you will see this Earth Data Login um, option here at the top. And so if you, in order to download the data that we're interested in, you, you need to log into your Earth Data account. And if you've never created one, 
you um, can go here to Earth Data Login and create an account. It's free, available for anyone um, to do. So what I'm going to do here is just click on Earth Data Login. And because I've logged in before, it should automatically authenticate me and um, take me back here. So now that I'm logged in, you just see your user account icon and not the Earth Data Login account. So now we're going to search for the MODIS vegetation indices, the 16-day um, level 3 global 500-meter data. So what we're going to do is, in, um, is first scroll over to California. So you can do this using your mouse and then zooming in either with your mouse or with the um, options on the right side of the um, viewer here. And then in the search bar up here, we're just going to go ahead and type in mod 13A1 because we know that that's the short name for the um, collection of interest. And then you will see that the collections down here along the bottom have changed. And what we're interested in here is this first one. This is our 16 day 500 meter. And this is the level six product or the version six product, excuse me. So if we click on that here, we've now selected that collection. But now we want to only select the um, data available for California. So if we come back to our um, subsetting options up here, we can do this spatial subset and then click on rectangle. And what we'll do is just create a small little rectangular box in California using our mouse. Once we do this, you should automatically see a green um, region that indicates the swath area for this MODIS um, tile. And so that should cover um, a large portion of California and some of the Southwest. Now we are going to do the temporal subsetting so that we can select the data for the time period of interest. So if we go to temporal, we are going to um, click on this recurring option because we're going to obtain data from each year from 2001 to 2010. So we'll just move this time slider here over to 2001 and move this one back to 2010. And now we're going to select the um, second half of July. So we'll click on July 17th as our start date. And then for our end date, we, it'll be July 19th. So then we can click on Apply Filter. Now you will automatically see that we have 10 matching granules here below. So we have one image one product for each year shown here from 2001 to 2010. So these are the data that we want um, and we'll just come over here to the sorry there guys we're just going to come over there then to the download data option and I'm just going to pull this back up right now. So we click here on this green button in the right called Download Data. This data access page will then give you some options for um, the properties that you want for the data that you're downloading. So the first thing is you'll see here is that you'll, ha you'll have 10 granules. And the, we'll leave a lot of the defaults already pre-checked. Um, here, the customized product default is already checked for you. You want to make sure that it pre-populates your email address here because you'll be receiving an email from the LPDAC notifying you when your, um, that your data order has gone through and then when it, when it is finished. We're going to leave this reformat option as GeoTIFF because that's what's going to be the most useful um, file type to use in QGIS. But as you can see here, you could select um, some different formats, such as KML, if you're interested in opening it in, in Google and um, Google Maps. 
We'll leave the spatial subsetting unchecked because we want that entire image. We'll leave the reprojection option as geographic, but again, you could change this to UTM or whatever um, projection that you're interested in. For the advanced settings, we'll go ahead and leave those as um, default as well. Now with the band subsetting, um, this is important to, to look at the, the uh, bands or the files that you're actually downloading here. So if you click on this arrow next to the, the product, you'll see you have the option to download multiple um, different files. And what I've done since I've already gone through this once before is I've unchecked all of these extra options. So the only thing that we're interested in keeping is the 500 meter 16 day NDVI. So we'll just make sure that's the only one that we have checked here. Then we can click on continue. Again, you just want to double check your contact information and um, before you click on the submit button. So if everything looks good, you can then click on submit. And what you'll see here is that your following collections have been processed. And you see this creating and processing. So you'll, you'll examine the, process, the progress of um, the LPDAC in processing those images. And once this is completed, you'll have two links here. And you'll have one that's a zipped folder of all of your files that you can download that directly. So I would recommend keeping this uh, page open when you're actually um, going through and, and doing your data downloading. So that for me was pretty quick. Um, you'll see here that I have now a zipped um, file that I can download directly from the website here. And so I've actually already done that and um, we'll be looking at that um, in a moment when we open up the files into QGIS. However, we so we now have the 2001 to 2000 10 data, but we want to examine the anomalies from 2015. So what we're going to do now is just go back to our Earth data search results here so that we can obtain that same image from 2015. When we click on back, it should preserve all of the parameters that you have um, selected within the, the search um, previously. We will just need to go down here and select our collection again. So if we just click on that, you can see this is, these were the options that we had previously. The only thing we're going to change now is that date range. So if we come back up to the temporal search, we're going to uncheck reoccurring because we only want that one data file. The start date is going to be 2015, July 17th. And the end date is going to be 2015, July 19th. And then we click on Apply Filter. Now you should just see one um, matching granule here. So that's our one um, file that we want. Once that is the only matching granule here, again, we can go in and click on Download Data. It'll take you through that same process, but as we just went through, we're leaving all of these as the default, except for that last um, option for the, the bands or the different file types that we're downloading. So we'll see one granule here. Customized product is checked. The reformat option is GeoTIFF. Projection option is geographic. All the advanced settings remain the same. And I recommend just checking to make sure that we have that one file, one folder selected that we are interested in. So here we have our 500 meter 16 day NDVI. And then again, we can click on continue, double check our um, information here, um, and then click on submit. Again, it'll create the, that link for you then. So that takes us through part one of the um, downloading the MODIS NDVI imagery. And just as a double check so that we, we know we're good for um, everything that we're doing in the exercises for next week, we're just going to go ahead and um, take a look at those files in QGIS. 
So I'm just going to um, leave our website window here. And also, as Amita um, talked about with the, the precipitation data, when you download these MODIS NDVI data, you get these folders with really long names. Um, so what you'll have is you'll have some kind of numbering convention for your initial um, folder. And then within each of those, you'll have a, a separate folder for each MODIS TIFF. And if, you, if I expand this really large, you can see that the file name here is really long. So again, all, all I've done is I've copied these .tiff files into a separate folder and renamed them with the date and then NDVI. So we'll, we'll take a look at this, but um, we have 2001, 2002, all the way up to 2010, and then our 2015 NDVI. Again, this is um, optional, but it, it helps if you're using these files later and um, you don't have to worry about having that really long naming convention. Okay, so we're just gonna now open up QGIS and very quickly take a look at the files to make sure um, they are what we want. So I just have a QGIS um, map document open here. And the first step that I'm gonna do here is just go to this Add Raster Layer button. If I click on that, I um, navigated to this folder already, so it takes me directly to my NDVI folder, but we could go to whatever folder you save it in on, on your computer. And just so that we can look at the images, we're just gonna um, select 2001 to 2010. And if you hold down the shift or um, control, if you're on a PC, um, you can select all of the, those images and add them at once. Otherwise, you can go through the same process and add each, each image individually. So we're just gonna click on open. And now you should see all of these images displayed in your layers panel here on the left. And we should kind of see an outline of that image here on the right. So it looks pretty good um, just at first glance. Um, for those of you familiar with California, we, we know that the Bay Area is here. This is the Central Valley. Um, so it looks like we're, we're getting the data that we need um, and we should be ready to go for next week. I just wanted to mention too that um, you might notice that the values for the NDVI images here on the left are not values between negative one and one. And this is a, a step that we will do in next week's exercise where we, we have to rescale the MODIS images. Um, so no need to worry that those values seem a little off at the moment. We'll, we'll deal with that in next week's exercise. One recommendation that I always make um, when, when working in QGIS or ArcGIS or any kind of software like this is saving your, um, saving your files pretty regularly. So we can just come up here to project and then save as, and you can save it as NDVI week one or whatever you would like. Um, and you can use this map again for next week, or you can just go ahead and, and restart that process of adding the, the imagery in. Really, this was just as a double check to make sure we're getting the right data that we need for next week. Um, so that concludes this part of the week one exercise for um, downloading the MODIS and DVI imagery. Again, uh, it, it's important for you to do this step first, and that's why we had you downloading the data in week one so that you can use it for the week two exercise. So for next week, we'll, um, we'll scale the MODIS data, we'll, we'll display the data with a color ramp, and we'll calculate the long-term NDVI average and then the anomaly for um, 2015 here. Great, so it looks like we have quite a few minutes now um, to answer any questions that you all may have. Um, so I am just going to go ahead and pull up our presentation again. So just bear with me for, for a moment here. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will all stay on um, for another about 20 minutes. 
and answer some questions that you may have. As a reminder, next week, um, same time, we will be really diving into the drought monitoring analysis and the applications. And it'll be more focused on working through these exercises and, and talking about how to actually then calculate these anomalies for both the precipitation as well as the, the vegetation indices. Um, so many of you have been doing this already, but if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat, into the question box, excuse me. Um, you can also type your name, location, organization, email, um, if you want to connect with your, your fellow remote sensing professionals. So if you do want to connect, currently um, we have we ask that you keep contact, uh, keep a list of those contacts as they're showing up in in the um, Q in the questions box. Um, but we might have a, a different option for for later on webinars where we have a list for you. But currently, um, it's up to you all to um, connect with each other. Um, so I will go ahead and um, just pause here for a moment. And um, Amita and I can and can answer any of your questions. So thanks again. Well, I'm, I just have um, I, I saw a couple of questions earlier on. One was, uh, are these data available everywhere and freely? So yes, they are. These are all uh, freely available data. Second question I had seen was comparison between TMP and iMERGE or TRIM and GPM. So yes, preliminary comparison has been done, but as you know, GPM was recently launched in 2015. So the algorithms are still, they were still being developed and now there is the current version four is operational. So when the algorithms are evolving, um, although it's com compared with trim, uh, just to see how, how where the values fall, it's not the final comparison. So when in early 2018, when trim TMPA and iMERGE long-term data come out, at that, that point, they will be uh, validated and calibrated with each other. So uh, yes, there has been comparison now, but more accurate answers will be available in early 2018. So there's also a question um, if there is any exercise for today's webinar. So um, these two exercises, 1A and 1B, precipitation NDVI data download, uh, if you were able to follow along when we were doing it, it's great. Otherwise, between now and 19th or next week, please make sure that you download all the data. And also, please make sure that you have QGIS on your uh, computer so that we can do analysis so you can follow along um, next week. Yeah, so there's a question about uh, from agricultural point of view, uh, which indices are preferred or what kind of time frame. So it, yes, for agricultural drought, Longer than six months, six months to nine months is a good period to average on. That's what the recommendation is from uh, Dark Mitigation Center. Um, also, PDSI uh, is a good indicator of agricultural drought, so longer term drought. So both SPI averaged over six to nine months and PDSI would be useful. There was a question whether the exercise can be done in Spanish, and yes, it can be done in Spanish. Uh, there will be homework posted in Spanish as well, so you can do it in Spanish. So there's a question here about uh, looking at climate variability and what uh, precipitation temperature indicators for last 30 to 40 years. So satellite remote sensing data are available um, Precipitation data are more reliably available since trim GPM era. But there are uh, something like Global Precipitation Climatology Project or GPCP that is available from 80s, so uh, starting from 1980 onwards. So you can try that. Um, there are CPC, um, uh, no, CDC, that's the Climate Data Center from NOAA that also has surface based data. Um, that is 
sometimes distributed by WMO, so you can uh, access those. So there's also a question, uh, the webinar is possible to get a video. So uh, yes, the um, presentation, a recording of the presentation will be available on our set website. Um, as soon as the webinar is done in a few days, it appears in our website, so you can go back and review. Um, here you're saying, Giovanni, you cannot find the page. There's HTTPS. There's S missing there. Then colon slash slash Giovanni. If you go to the appropriate slide, you will get the address. So, Amber, there is a question here, um, Cindy. Could you please provide some information on DSI trout product from MODIS? Yeah, thanks, Anita. Um, I am actually not specifically familiar with that product. Um, mm -hmm. So that might be a good question if you would like to email us. Um, we can dive more um, into that and, and get some more information for you. But that's not a product I have specifically used in the past um, myself. So sorry, we can't really answer question. I can't really answer any questions on the spot about that one, but I'd be happy to look into that further um, if you want to email me directly. Thank you. So there's a uh, comment and question here about using CRU uh, precipitation data. So that is rain gauge based data and it's long term. Uh, since 1990 or earlier, so again, if you are looking for satellite based data, GPCP would be the one to look at. That's from NASA and uh, NOAA also has a version of that. But um, GPCP is available since 1980. Amita, I just wanted to answer the question about the MODIS. Um, oh. DSI product. Um, it's actually, it's not a standard product available uh, through the LPDAC. It's a product that's available through the University of Montana. Um, and it's only right now, it looks like it's only available um, through an FTP site at the University of Montana for the years 2000 to 2011, that eight day and annual time interval. So like I say, it's not a standard product that's produced um, through the LPDAC or through, um, through NASA. So we can give you a website for that um, if you're interested in, the, in that DSI product. There's a question, is there a way to link drought to possible forest fires? Um, it, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for forest fires. Uh, that's one of the challenges in trying to determine the risk of an area to forest fire, and certainly drought is one of them. Um, so a lot of people have used something like NDVI to look at anomalies or something like that to determine how much drought is occurring in an area to determine a level of fire risk. But um, fire risk is very complicated. So it, it, it can definitely be used for one factor in looking at the risk of wildfire. So there's a question. Yes, this webinar is recorded and recording will be available on our set website very soon. So the question is, which remote sensing data one can use for monitoring hydrological drought? So soil moisture is uh, one source of data. So um, the NOAA experimental drought monitor, if you go there, it has links to go to soil moisture uh, data, especially this is for US. Um, for global soil moisture data, there may be um, that you may use global land data assimilation model. And then so looking at um, surface and subsurface moisture anomalies, soil moisture anomalies, one can look at a hydrological drought also by looking at groundwater um, changes or depletion 
you can look at hydrologic trial. So there's a question, why is it not always possible to get imagery for Jamaica? So uh, there are a couple of reasons I can think of. Uh, if you're looking at something like trim, which is quarter of a degree resolution data, you might have uh, very few grid points over Jamaica. Uh, if you're looking at MODIS or Lancet data, uh, if there, is a, there are a lot of clouds, these sensors cannot see the surface. So in the cloudy conditions, you might not see uh, Jamaica at all or from Lancet or MODIS or any optical sensors. Um, from something like trim, it would be the resolution issue that you might just have a few points, grid points over Jamaica. So there's a question, can I use NDVI to compare with SPI, SPI or PDSI at various timescales? So yes, that is possible. I mean, that's a somewhat of a research uh, problem for your area that you're looking at. But uh, you should be able to uh, have correspondence between decrease in precipitation and then decrease in vegetation or the other way should be able to see some relationship. I'm sure it is complex. It's not linear or simple. And it's area dependent, but you should be able to, um, to, to relate those two. We also request that we, um, you keep your questions to the webinar material. Uh, so mostly related to drought, precipitation, and DVI that we have been talking about. We see questions about air pollution and other. Um, if you go to our set website, you can get more information about um, different thematic areas that our set does training in. So there's a question uh, given the time and cost needed to download data in some countries, is it permitted under the US law to? to small data DVDs. Um, so RSET um, is not involved in doing that. And um, if it is the internet issue, um, usually in each country, there are some organizations, uh, I'm sure, that have better internet connection. And they can download the data and, and make small DVDs. But uh, RSET or NASA uh, cannot do it. Amita, there's one question here, um, and maybe this will be the last one since we're hitting the top of the hour here. But the question is, um, does the land use change influence the comparison of the 10-year average of NDVI? That's a really great question. And depending on the nature and the size of the land use change, it certainly could influence the 10-year average of the NDVI. So if you have large land use change, um, happening in one year or in multiple years, that will, of course, if, if you're decreasing vegetation, that will de decrease your overall average. I mean, hopefully over the average of the 10 years, it won't make that much of a difference, but it really depends on the size of the change. So that's something to keep in mind when you're figuring out what that period of that average should be, because the period of the average doesn't have to be 10 years. All right. Well, thank you, Cindy, for that final question. And again, thank you all for um, being on with us today. And we look forward to um, speaking with you all next week. Um, so please let us know if you have additional questions. You can email us at the, the um, addresses listed. And um, thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.